and introduce our speaker today. So we have Erica Lyons with, the, or Lyon with us today. I always want to add an S to your name, that end of your name. I don't know why. Midwest Ohio thing, I guess. Uh, anyways, Erica Lyon here today, OSU Extension Educator from Jefferson and Harrison County. She's been with us before and she's given us terrific webinars on fungi and she's back to do that once again. So thank you so much, Erica. And I'm going to stop sharing and let you take it away. Thank you, Marnie. All right, it might take me a second just to get this up. Looks great. Okay. And you're not seeing the notes version? Nope. Okay, fantastic. All right, if at any point I'm not uh, coming through, just let me know. So good morning, everyone. Uh, just a little bit before we dive into the world of fungi uh, and to give you a little bit of history or uh, a little bit of an update on my background. Uh, I started with OSU Extension uh, coming up on eight years now, time flies. Um, prior to that, I got my master's degree from University of Maine in ecology and environmental science with a focus on plant pathology and mycology. So that's kind of how I got into this field. If you haven't been to Maine uh, before to see all the wonderful mushrooms up there, I highly recommend it. Uh, of course, living in Ohio, we also have tons and tons of wonderful mushrooms, uh, if you know where to look. Uh, since working for OSU, I've given many programs on wild fungi and have answered questions from folks from across the state on finding, identifying, and uh, occasionally growing mushrooms. All right. All right, so just a little bit of uh, an overview of today's talk. I'm going to talk specifically about how wood decay fungi affect woodlands. Uh, give a brief overview of what decay is and the fungal roles that will ultimately affect uh, woodland structure and composition. Um, Dive into a little bit on the wood decay categories. Uh, unfortunately, they're not all black and white. There's a lot of gray and uh, these categories you'll find will exist on a continuum. Uh, we'll talk, uh, give a very broad overview of the decay processes and biology. Uh, we could talk a whole semester about this stuff uh, and I'm gonna condense it down to a few slides. Uh, then go into the impact on woodland communities, uh, why we should care, and then lastly, how can we manage and utilize that decay process uh, for our woodlands? So what is decay? Uh, from a forest management point of view, decay may sound alarming. Uh, when the word decay is used, it's often in phrases such as urban decay, moral decay, that have these negative connotations to them. However, when we talk about woodlands, these terms are really all beneficial, detrimental, and everything in between. It's not black and white. Uh, fungi are considered one of the main drivers of decomposition using their extracellular enzymes to break down compounds and to actively transfer carbon, nutrients, water, and oxygen through their interconnected networks. So a few definitions, uh, if you do not have a mycology background or have not worked with mushrooms before, um, the term hypha or hyphae plural is the individual filament or thread-like structure that makes up a fungus. If we were to look at some fungal tissue under a microscope, you would see all these threads and each thread is a hypha. Uh, a mat of hyphae together is a mycelium. Uh, if I use the term fruiting body, this is essentially a fancy word for reproductive structure or mushroom. Um, not all fungi will produce mushrooms as their fruiting structure. Um, so that's why I might sometimes use that term instead of mushroom. Uh, it can be analogous to fruit in plants in that they serve a similar function. Uh, in the case of mushrooms, they house the spores, whereas in plants, the fruit house the seeds. And then finally, we have the spore, which is the reproductive unit of the fungus. Uh, spores are not equal, the equivalent to seeds, but again, they are analogous in their function of getting the parent genetics out into the world. There are five main roles that fungi can have in a forest that ultimately help to shape it. Uh, the first is pathogens, which are disease-causing organisms. Uh, I will use the term saprophytes, which is essentially decomposers. Uh, it refers to the role primarily involved in decomposition, taking complex organic compounds and reducing them down to a simpler form. 
Endophytes are latent fungi found within living plant tissue. They might assist a plant or they might just be mostly benign. Uh, the last group are the mycorrhizal fungi. These fungi form symbiotic associations with plant root systems that often comes at a benefit, or at least so the current thought of most is, uh, to both organisms. Often these fungi provide plants with improved access to water and nutrients such as nitrogen in the soil while receiving extra carbon from that host plant. In addition, fungal fruiting bodies or mushrooms, as well as hyphal mats of mycelium can provide a food source for some insects and wildlife. So let's dive into these roles further, starting with the pathogens. Uh, with pathogens, growth and development comes at a cost to the host, and that's what ultimately causes disease. Some pathogens will outright kill the host, such as oak wilt, uh, once infected, while others begin rather harmlessly, but they can be triggered by certain environmental conditions um, or a change in status of the plant. Uh, there are some that are considered to be more parasitic in that they are detrimental to the host, but don't necessarily outright kill the host right away. In order for disease to occur, uh, the pathogen has to occur with both the host and the environmental conditions present. This is called the uh, what we call the disease triangle. If you remove one of these legs of the triangle, let's say we remove the environment and we just have the host and the pathogen, disease is not going to occur. Of course, if we remove the host and we just have the pathogen in the environment, disease won't occur. Uh, saprophytic fungi uh, excrete en enzymes from their hyphae that digest woody material and break down compounds into simpler forms. Through this decomposition process, nutrients are released into the soil, such as calcium and magnesium. Uh, they can also help improve soil structure, which is what they're mostly known for. And then we get to the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, this group uh, tends to be a little bit more complex and requires a little bit more explanation. Uh, they all are thought to have a mutualistic association that benefits both a fungus and the tree, although there are some, there is some debate on whether there might be some parasitism going on there. Uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi form a sheath around a plant's roots, and they often produce mushrooms that release the spores. Ecto pretty much means outside of that root. Uh, milk mushrooms, rushulas, and slippery jack are an example of these fungi. Um, of this photo, it, kind of off on the center right uh, with the root system, that is showing what the ectomycorrhizal sheath around those roots looks like. Um, and then it, in the lower right-hand corner, we have a milk mushroom. Endomycorrhizal fungi do not produce mushrooms, uh, but they are found within a plant's tissue, much as endophytic fungi, specifically in the root system. Ones that are present within woodlands include arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, whose hyphae break through a plant's cortical cells in the roots. They form structures within the plant root cells called arbuscules, and some of them produce best, uh, can't talk today, vesicles as well. So you can kind of see that um, here in the le lower left hand image, we've got some uh, endomycorrhizal fungi um, that are embedded in that plant uh, tissue in the root system. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi help plants capture additional nutrients and water that might be tied up in micropores in the soil. So in soils, we have our macropores, which are the large spaces where plant roots can easily access water and air. Um, but a lot of space can be tied up in these really small area, small gaps in the soil called the micropores. And plant roots cannot easily access the water that's stored in there. So that's something that mycorrhizal fungi can help. Uh, they can also assist with environmental stressors, helping prime a plant's uh, immune system, so to say. Uh, the sheath that's produced in ectomycorrhizae can help protect plant roots from soil-borne diseases, uh, creating a physical barrier, but also allowing um, those mycorrhizal fungi to outcompete those pathogenic fungi. So all trees in woodlands are host to endophytic fungi. This is probably the least well-known group. Uh, fungal endophytes live within plant tissue, very similar to mycorrhizal fungi, except they're not just located in the root system. They can be found 
uh, throughout a plant within their plant cells as well as in between cells, uh, which is what this, I tried to draw, do a general graphic showing this. I'm not sure if I succeeded or not, um, but essentially they can grow within and between cells. Uh, they can be latent until triggered by some inciting factors, or they might just be harmless. Uh, there's some that might have a mutualistic relationship. Uh, this has often been theorized uh, with endophytes often assisting trees with both abiotic and biotic stresses. So like drought and disease, they can also compete or antagonize pathogenic uh, microorganisms or improve resistance within the plant itself. Very similar to the mycorrhizal fungi kind of priming that plant's uh, immunity. So the needs of wood decay fungi are basically the same needs as a majority of organisms on Earth. Uh, most fungi require moisture levels above 30% to thrive. If you've ever grown shiitake mushrooms, for example, you know that the moisture level needs to be kept above this level. Uh, when it starts dropping below, especially below 25%, you're gonna start seeing that fungal mycelium die off or it's gonna be easily outcompeted by other microbes. Each species has a specific temperature range. Uh, there is no one size fits all. They all have various temperatures at which they thrive. Uh, that said, most fungi are considered to be mesophiles. Uh, that means their temperature ranges typically fall within 41 degrees Fahrenheit to 95 degrees Fahrenheit for growth to occur. They might have some dormancy stages outside of this range, um, but that is generally where those fungi will occur. Now we do have our extremophiles, uh, that can go way beyond these ranges, but those are not typically ones we're going to encounter. Uh, most wood decay fungi are aerob aerobic organisms, which means they require oxygen to survive. Although they don't necessarily need as much compared to what's already available in the atmosphere. So this is why you'll sometimes see sawmills storing logs in the summertime in ponds or um, placing them under sprinklers to prevent fungal problems, it's a little counterintuitive, um, until the, those logs can be sawn into lumber. And the reason this works is because the moisture content in the logs is high enough that it limits the amount of oxygen uh, that is ultimately available to that fungus. The substrate the fungus grows on, uh, in this case, when we talk about wood decay, we're talking about wood, uh, provides its food source. Uh, this can be nitrogen, carbon, among many other nutrients critical for their biological functions. So how do these roles fit into and shape a woodland ecosystem? Here we have a graphical depiction of an uneven aged woodland structure that includes uh, dominant and co-dominant trees making up that forest canopy. We also have intermediate trees that are shade tolerant species, making up that space between the canopy and the understory, as well as the suppressed trees that are waiting essentially for an opening to form in the canopy. So that way they can grow large fairly quickly and become the dominant or co-dominant trees there. Uh, then of course we have our shrubs and ground cover that also make up part of the forest understory. So wood decay fungi can act as architects when it comes to woodland structure. Uh, if you think of pathogenic fungi as your demolition crew, as a tree ages, it becomes less vigorous, uh, especially once you get past maturity. Often our native pathogenic fungi are opportun opportunists or secondary invaders. So that is, they're not gonna outright kill the plant. They're gonna start off more parasitic in nature um, and can eventually lead or contribute to the demise of that tree but they're not gonna be the sole cause of that. Uh, a tree may fall at this point or become a snag. Uh, snags are dead trees serving as habitat for wildlife. Uh, they can help create openings in the canopy for smaller or younger trees, more healthy trees to take over. Uh, saprophytic fungi serve as your foundation builders. These decay fungi break down dead woody tissue into soil organic matter, matter that improves that soil quality for existing vegetation. This buildup of organic matter can also improve habitat for seedlings and mycorrhizal fungi as well, which we'll get into here in a little bit, and is important for the next generation of plants to occupy that space. Mycorrhizal fungi essentially can act as the plumbing and the transportation system, carrying water and nutrients from the soil to the plant's roots. 
Uh, and there's even some research that indicates there may also be a signaling function of mycorrhizal fungi that will ultimately connect trees together and so form some sort of rudimentary communication system. Uh, when we talk about different fungi, a lot of times we can group them as generalists or specialists. Uh, when we say generalist, generalist wood decay fungi can grow on a variety of trees, although many species are confined to coniferous or deciduous type wood. They also may fill multiple ecological niches. Um, when we use the word niches, that's uh, the, essentially the role. Um, so that includes endophyte to pathogen to saprophyte. And they, these ones, the generalists tend to thrive in those fragmented uh, systems or fragmented habitats that we have a lot of in Ohio. A great example of a generalist is our malaria fungi that can infect not only multiple species of trees, but shrubs and herbaceous plants as well. So they have a wide host range. Now, when we talk about specialists, these ones are often dependent on a single species or family of plants. Uh, it may, may also be dependent on a specific environment with a unique relationship role or interaction. They often have specific enzymes or mechanisms that allow them to break down or colonize their host or their environment. Because they are tied to a specific host, if the host begins to disappear, you're generally gonna see that specialist disappear as well. They are especially vulnerable in fragmented habitats and do well in landscapes with a lot of dead wood and a good proportion of old forest present. This also makes them more vulnerable to extinction, however. Uh, some, a lot of our brown rot fungi, and we'll talk a little bit about what makes a brown rot fungus, a brown rot fungus uh, here in a little bit, but most of these ones are specialists of certain conifer species. Um, that said, we do have a white rot. Um, the first one that comes to mind is weeping conch, uh, which is only found on oak trees. So it's a pretty nasty pathogen of oak trees, um, but that said, you're generally not going to see it on anything else. All right, so here's where we get into some scientific jargon that's a little hard to avoid. There are two main phyla. Uh, phyla is the group underneath kingdom, when we go kingdom, phylum, um, and so on. So uh, there are two main phyla or overarching groups that wood decay fungi belong to. Um, there are a few exceptions that occur outside of these two groups, but these are the big ones. The biggest difference between these two groups are characteristics of the structure, the structures that house the spores, which we're not really going to get into that today. That's going to get um, even more into the technical weeds. Um, but there are also general divisions between these two groups in terms of when they appear during the stages of the decay process. So the first group here, which is on the left, is the Ascomycota. Um, these are sometimes referred to as sac fungi, and this is a huge group. Um, only a few are mushroom forming. Uh, this includes a lot of our plant pathogens, uh, also pathogens of animals and parasites of other fungi. These can often occur early in the decay process as latent endophytes, or you might also see them in the late stages of decay as your soft rots, taking over environments that are often humid and nutrient rich, and breaking down uh, the leftovers or leftover cellulose. When we get to the basidiomycota, these are also known as club fungi. Uh, these ones are slower at colonization and they tend to appear later in the decay process. Uh, this group includes many of our fungi belonging to the white and brown rots. And we also have this group producing many of our iconic mushrooms uh, and conchs that one associates with the word fungus. So typically, if I say the word mushroom, most of the time I'm referring to the basidiomycota. All right, so now we'll dive into the categories of wood decay. Uh, wood decay is essentially decomposition of structural components of wood by microorganisms, primarily by enzymatic activity uh, by fungi. The following slides, we will go through the general categories, including white rot, brown rot, and sap rot. But it is important to keep in mind that while I'm talking about general categories, these rots really occur on a spectrum. You're going to see that some fungi have characteristics of multiple categories, and they don't just fit neatly into one specific category. 
So our first one is the white rots. Uh, white rots belong to the Basidio mycota uh, and are often characterized by spongy, soft, or stringy rot of wood. These white rots uh, break down cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, or essentially pretty much all of the components of wood. They are more frequently found in deciduous trees, but can also be found in conifers as well. Um, you have oxidation and lignin loss uh, that result in a yellowish or whitish coloration from which that name is derived. They can be found in living, dying, and dead trees, and they can produce spalted wood with patterns of discoloration that may be sought after in the industry. Uh, some of these species of white rots go through selective uh, delignification. So while you still have all the components being decayed, that's the cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, the rates of breakdown will vary. So typically you're going to see your lignin and hemicelluloses decayed early on, leaving behind your enriched cellulose. So when you see mottled looking rot and white pocket rots, um, that's what's going on here. Uh, there is a lot of interest in using these fungi in the industry because many uses of wood involve removing lignin, so like biopulping, for example. Uh, these are just a few examples of white rots that you might encounter as you walk through the woods. Um, probably the most common one is going to be the turkey tail or Tramedes versicolor. Uh, we also have the violet tooth polypore, which this year just went through a, a scientific name change. It used to be Tricaptum biform. Uh, now it, it's this much harder to say scientific name, which I still need to practice on saying. Uh, we also have our split gill mushroom or Schizophyllum commune, uh, which is one of the most common uh, species of fungi found around the world. Uh, you will pretty much find them in every country, except maybe not Antarctica. And then we also have uh, tree oysters or pleur Pleurotus austriatus. Uh, this is a common uh, mushroom used in gourmet mushroom production, um, but it is a type of white rot. Brown rots likely evolved several times from a white rot ancestor the fungi that cause brown rots depends more on acidic environments. There are no fibrous texture existing because that cellulose is broken up early on. As a result, that you'll see that wood kind of shrink on drying, and then you'll get that cross-checking or cubicle pattern that is oftentimes seen in the later stages. This is like one of the key um, visual ways to identify brown rots, and this is why it's sometimes called cubicle rot. While brown rots are more often associated with conifers, uh, there are some, such as chicken of the woods, that will occur on deciduous wood, woods as well. The initial stage of brown rot is non-enzymatic. Uh, the fungus produces chemical agents involving oxalic acid and hydrogen peroxide that essentially snips these chains of cellulose and hemicellulose into fairly small pieces, um, and this occurs early on. And this essentially leads to sugars that are released, which are subsequently taken up by the fungal mycelium. There are a few brown pocket rots, which are kind of cool to find, uh, such as the cedar brown pocket rot shown here. Uh, these types of brown rots only develop in living trees uh, and often in tree species that have unusually durable wood that are able to seal off that rot. Uh, so that kind of indicates that they have effective antifungal chemicals produced in their heartwood. And we'll talk a little bit about what heart, heartwood and sapwood uh, have to do with this here in a little bit. So some brown rot examples, uh, your sulfur shelf uh, or chicken of the woods, uh, dry rots, which are a lot of times associated with um, brown rot found in uh, structures that can be problematic. Uh, conifer maize gill, uh, is another example, as is the birch polypore. All right, so now let's dive into soft rots. Uh, initially, the term soft rot pertained to surface wood rot that resulted in very soft, mushy kind of wood. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that this name is a misnomer, uh, as all decay types will actually show that kind of soft um, decay over time. Soft rots primarily belong to the ascomycota group of fungi, 
they occur very late in the decay process when those conditions become less suitable for your white and brown rots to continue development. Like white rots, these organisms break down cell cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. These fungi can penetrate deep uh, into wood with excessive moisture, but not necessarily well-saturated wood or where you see uh, pooling water. Uh, however, that said, they can also grow under drier conditions. So just because it's dry out does not mean that these fungi have stopped growing or are dying off. Uh, when the wood dries, it develops surface checks across the grain as the wood shrinks and becomes brown in color, very similar to what you see in brown rot decay. And this is why these categories are not as clear cut. Uh, some may cause wood to even appear bleached in appearance, similar to white rots. So an example of a soft rot fungus is the fungus uh, Ustalina, which produces a root and butt rot in a lot of European beech trees in landscape settings. Uh, this fungus can also be found on American beech, sugar maple, red maple, uh, and Norway maple. That said, sometimes you'll find them on less common hosts, such as oak, linden, hackberry, apple, and many other hardwoods. So this one is kind of more of a, a generalist, but it does have a preference among wood species. All right, so you also hear of um, positions of decay uh, being used as categories. So we'll dive into each of these. Um, top rot, we're not gonna get into uh, too much. It's essentially decay that happens at the top of the tree. Um, but a lot of times what we see with our rot, uh, wood decay fungi is stem and trunk rots, butt rots, and root rots. But first off, let's start talking about sap rots and heart rots. Uh, plants will have a defense response to the invasion of pathogens or rot fungi. Uh, keep in mind, uh, rots may occur within the sapwood or in the heartwood, and each of these sections have very different strategies for defense. Um, heartwood is essentially your dead wood. It has no active resistance to these pathogens or to these wood decay fungi. Instead, you have antimicrobial chemicals that are deposited in the heartwood as it forms by uh, some certain dying cells within that wood. This creates a space that is fairly inhospitable to most fungi, not all. Uh, species vary greatly in their heartwood resistance as well. So for example, cedars have very high resistance, such as, um, oh, I messed that up. Um, your ones that have low resistance are going to be aspen and birch. Uh, that said, certain fungi have adapted to grow in the heartwood where there is less competition, and these fungi cause heart rot. Sapwood uh, surrounds the heartwood and has active plant resistance uh, to sap rot invaders. Uh, when the plant detects an intruder or when wounding occurs uh, in this area, uh, a defense response is initiated within the plant. The cells within the plant will form a reaction zone, uh, which can lead to discoloration in the wood and ultimately creates unfavorable conditions for any invaders. The plant then compartmentalizes around that infected area by creating uh, that reaction zone. The area just beyond the reaction zone is your transition zone, where in some plants you have phenolic compounds and dry zones that are produced to further protect that healthy sapwood. Uh, that said, this sounds like a lot of defense here, um, and it does provide quite a bit of security for the plant. However, there are some fungi that have adapted and they're able to detoxify that sapwood to further expand, and that's when you start getting your sap rot fungi. Uh, however, sapwood in non-living logs is more susceptible to wood decay than heartwood, um, so it's generally more vulnerable at that stage after that tree is already dead, uh, rather than when the tree is alive. Uh, so here are some examples of heart rot, um, and actually many of these listed here on the slide cause both heart rots and sap rots, um, but these are ones that are known to make it into that heartwood. Uh, we've got our parchment fungus, uh, which is multiple species of sterium, uh, the false tinder polypore, uh, canker rots, and uh, tree oysters, once again, um, are examples of your heart rots. For your sap rot examples, um, shiitake is a 
probably my go-to whenever I think of saprot, I think of shiitake mushrooms, because when you grow shiitakes, you want to make sure that you're getting a good ratio of sapwood to heartwood. We also have the veiled polypore in this group. Uh, this mushroom typically appears only on dead pines. The spores are released through ruptures on the underside of the uh, mushroom itself that's growing out of that tree. So you can kind of see here that there's that covering over the gills, um, but that will eventually break open to release the spores. We also have uh, hairy turkey tail, which is closely related to our typical turkey tail, um, and then hypoxylon caker as well. All right, so your root, butt, and trunk rots. Um, this is oftentimes referring to decay in the root system of the tree that might expand further upward. Uh, it progresses into the crown and further into the trunk. And a lot of times while it's these um, fungi are attacking the roots, your symptoms will oftentimes appear in the canopy. You'll see wilting leaves, uh, generally thinning canopy. You might see some flagging going on. Um, and that can be an indicator of something going on deep underground. Uh, a lot of times decay in the basal portion of a trunk where trees make contact with the soil uh, is, is oftentimes referred to as your butt or trunk rots. Um, and these ones will move oftentimes into the heartwood or they will move further upward as well. Um, the problem with a lot of your butt rots is they, because of where they're located at, they're affecting that structural integrity of that wood close to the base of the tree. So that's really going to impact the structural integrity of that tree. So some examples of root and butt rots. Um, weeping conch is probably one of the most notorious uh, butt rots that's out there. Uh, I mentioned earlier that weeping conch is a bit of a specialist. It primarily focuses on oak trees that are greater than 100 years old. Um, a lot of times when you see weeping conch, the fruiting body will grow around vegetation um, surrounding that tree. So someone brought me a sample one time where um, it had grown around a piece of bed straw. Uh, that was kind of interesting. But this one, when you see it on uh, your oak tree, you're probably going to want to call someone or remove that tree yourself because it's going to come down on its own, especially if it's near a house or a structure or a path. Um, that's going to pose a safety risk, and that tree should probably be removed right away. Uh, artist bracket is also uh, in this uh, group. Uh, so Ganoderma species are common examples of your root and butt rots, uh, primarily your uh, butt rots. Hen of the woods, uh, one of the one of uh, mushroom hunters' favorite finds out in the in the woods, uh, is a type of butt rot that you will encounter, as is lion's mane. Now you might see like, for example, lion's mane might grow further up on the tree um, or further up on the trunk, um, but that's where we're kind of like, these are not definitive categories. A lot of uh, fungi can exist in multiple categories. Uh, honey fungus or armillaria species are classic examples of uh, root rot type fungi. They are considered to be parasitic of trees. A lot of times if you're walking in the woods and you see these really dark black uh, ropey structures. These are mycelial cords called rhizomorphs that um, armillaria can produce. And uh, they're notorious for um, coming in through the soil. Sometimes people will find them, find the mushrooms in their yard in the middle of a lawn, no trees around, but a lot of times that fungus is actually growing from a decaying root system beneath the soil. Uh, Dead Man's Fingers, one of my favorite finds out there just because it's so weird, uh, belongs to the Xylaria genus of fungi. Um, it's an example of a uh, type of butt rot that occurs fairly later on in the decay process. It's not going to be something that's going to um, outright kill the tree, but it will probably take advantage of a dying tree. Uh, and then we also have Enosis root rot as well. And then we have our wood staining fungi. There are many kinds of sap staining fungi, mostly belonging to the Ascomycota phylum. Uh, there are a few that um, do exist in the Basidiomycota. Uh, 
a lot of them will produce or the ones that are most noticeable will produce wood that is like a blue green in color. Um, the blue green discoloration of the sapwood. Um, a lot of times you'll see this initially form in like wedge like shapes uh, when you look at a cross section of the tree. Uh, and this belongs, this is created by the genera uh, Ophiostoma and Ceratocytus uh, fungi. Uh, the blue stained fungi uh, frequently originate from bark beetle galleries. Uh, so they are uh, one of those ones where that can be vectored um, by bark beetles. Uh, another group of fungi are wind disseminated uh, and produce various colors, including um, some of that blue, browns, and gray coloration. Uh, and these ones can be from aerobicidium or alternaria species. Alternaria are notorious plant pathogens. Uh, black stain fungi, which are closely related to the blue stain fungi I mentioned below, uh, above, also block the water conducting uh, vascular system uh, within a plant. So they can be uh, considered sort of a vascular wilt uh, type issue. However, black uh, stained fungi spread to trees by root to root contact as well. And you'll find this with a lot of uh, pathogenic species. They can be spread by root grafting. Uh, the images in the upper right, uh, I mentioned earlier spalted wood being created by white rot fungi. Um, this is what you might see with that, that spalting pattern that sometimes people seek out in wood. Uh, cankers. So cankers are often grouped with decay fungi, but they technically have their own characteristics. Uh, like other pathogenic fungi, they can enter through wounds in the trunk uh, or in branches. They are often known to form localized lesions that have a variety of appearances, as you can see here. Uh, they might be roughened, sunken, or discolored. And these signs and symptoms are often limited to the sapwood. So you can see that in the lower left-hand image here. Uh, we've got a black rock canker that has completely decayed the um, sapwood on the left side. Uh, in the middle here, we have Phomopsis canker on Hawthorn. Uh, we have chestnut blight uh, on the lower right-hand image where you've got those cracks in the wood. And then Nectria canker is the top photo there that produces more of these pustule-like growths. What's interesting is development of cankers is oftentimes fa favored by understocking woodlots. Um, so that might, if you're having a lot of uh, canker issues, you might wanna check the stocking density of your woodlot. Oftentimes infected trees are usually younger, which kind of differentiates this group from uh, wood rot fungi. Wood rot fungi often go after more mature trees. Uh, so cankers go after trees less than 25 years old. Um, you might see them in older trees, but if older trees have remained canker free uh, when they were younger, they typically are more resistant uh, to canker issues as they mature. This differs from many uh, wood decay fungi, fungal species that I mentioned earlier. Um, An other example not shown here, hypoxylon canker um, is associated with infecting aspen between the ages of 15 and 40 years old. Um, if you have a pure stand of aspen trees and you're starting to find a few that have cankers, it's very difficult to control. So it's best to convert that stand to another species or start diversifying that stand. All right, so I mentioned we're gonna do a really broad dive into the biology and processes of decay. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's still important to understand um, the basics of. So when we think about decay, we have to understand wood chemistry. Um, a key component of the decay process is the food source. This is often species dependent since different wood decay fungi have different needs or are obligate to certain hosts. The big differences between the white and the brown rots is what sugars and polymers they require. So in general, um, and this is on average, this is not specifically related to all wood, but on average wood contains about 45% cellulose, 25% hemicellulose, and 25% lignin. Uh, the ranges for the each component here is actually much wider, but these are, are just averages. Uh, decay is erratic, 
uh, what you will oftentimes see is the wood around the wound will initially discolor, indicating that the plant has initiated chemical changes. Uh, this is before development of wood decay, as it is the plant's response to seal off that wound immediately. Uh, there are also already microbes on the surface of that wood that serves as a type of barrier either to inhibit uh, growth and development of wood decay fungi or to compete for resources with them. It's important to note that discolor wood early on does not necessarily mean compromised strength or integrity in that tree. It might just simply be a plant's response. Uh, tree species will dictate which microorganisms survive. Uh, some decay fungi can infect a variety of trees, but only thrive on a select few. So for example, if you've ever grown shiitake, uh, shiitake is a white rot fungus. Uh, this particular fungus grows best and produces greater mushroom yields on oak and sweet gum trees with a high sapwood to heartwood ratio. However, you can also grow shiitakes on a variety of other species, including maple, cherry, ironwood, uh, to name a few. Um, you might not get near the yields that you would see on the ones that are excellent producers, but you can still grow mushrooms on them. Uh, you cannot grow shiitakes on conifers. Uh, they generally do not uh, grow very well or are not compatible with your softwoods. Uh, brown rots in general tend to do well on your conifer species and even have preferences among conifers. So for example, some species in the Phomatopsis, Osicalis, and Antrididae Ugh. Antrodia genera all have preferences for spruce, um, but they don't necessarily like fir trees. So they're very specific in the in the type of conifers. They won't just infect all conifers. Uh, brown rots also tend to have adaptations that allow them to grow well in heartwood. Um, remember, in the heartwood, you're getting these antifungal chemicals that are being produced, and that creates less competition, primarily from white rot. That said, brown rots have actually adapted to grow and have some resistance to these antifungal compounds. And that's why you tend to see them occupying that uh, heartwood space. Of the wood rot fungi infecting conifers, 23% are brown rot fungi. So compare that to brown rots making up only 7% of wood decay fungi in deciduous tree species. So they're primarily associated with conifers, but in each group of trees, uh, you're typically going to see your white rots occur. Uh, white rots are far more diverse in both types, uh, but once again, brown rots are more associated with conifers than deciduous. Uh, so this is a general uh, decay cycle of the Basidiomycota. Um, Ascomycota varies a little bit differently, but I'm using this one because this is what this is the group that we see the mushrooms um, and the larger fruiting bodies. Uh, generally, the Basidiomycota have longer incubation periods compared to Ascomycetes, so that means they take a little bit longer to colonize the wood. Uh, you have mushrooms that produce spores. Uh, these spores will make contact with an open wound on a plant or on the surface of a plant. With favorable conditions, you'll have germination occurring uh, where the initial hyphal filaments will grow into that woody structure. Those hyphal uh, filaments are fairly strong and they can penetrate through that woody tissue. Uh, mushrooms do not appear immediately. Uh, typically, the fruiting bodies are way down the road in the cycle. Um, what you first need is hyphae from different genetics uh, to fuse together during colonization of the wood. And not just different genetics, like you can't just take two, um, you've got two individuals of a species of fungus. That doesn't mean their spores are going to mix. Uh, they have to be the same, uh, or not the same, they have to be compatible with one another. Uh, so hyphae from different genetics first need to fuse together during colonization of the wood. Uh, once this happens, colonization can be fast or slow, depending on that species. Uh, for some, it can take several years before that tissue is colonized to the point that you're going to see that fruiting. Once you have full colonization, you get uh, the pinning stage that's triggered, which is pretty much you'll see little tiny mushrooms forming. And then once the mushroom or fruiting body matures, it's only after it matures that you're gonna get that spore that's produced and released, starting that cycle again. So what's the point of going through all of this? Um, 
Point being that by the time you see conchs or mushrooms form on the tree, the interior wood has already been colonized and decayed for quite some time, and that's going to compromise the structural integrity of the tree. Just removing the mushroom itself is not going to solve the problem because you still have much of that mass of the fungus embedded within that woody tissue. <laughs> So the decay process occurs on a continuum with different microbial communities present at each step. Um, so if you've heard of the term ecological succession, um, that's pretty much the transition of uh, or composition transition in, of the composition of um, com uh, communities over time. So we a lot of times see this happen large scale in woodlands. For example, if you have a disturbance you have an open area or field that's eventually going to get colonized by your uh, shrubby species and early stage succession species. And then later on down towards the end, you're going to get your mature woodlands. So something similar like this happens on uh, the, mi the uh, microbial scale. Uh, competition for space, food, water <laughs> leads to changes in the microbial makeup of decay. Uh, a lot of times you'll see the strongest competitor, competitor occupying the largest volume of wood, uh, which influences the rates of decay, uh, even the types of decay and downstream succession. Uh, you might see overall decomposition changing um, that environment through succession. Uh, species also interact with one another through antagonism. So that is they compete with one another. Uh, sometimes they'll produce these uh, compounds to reduce the growth of their competitor. Sometimes they will outright uh, parasitize other microbes. Um, there are quite a few cases of different fungi that parasitize other fungi, including wood decay fungi. And then some have a mutualistic uh, relationship where they might work together. Um, let's say one fungus is good at breaking down one compound and the other is good at breaking down the other. Um, so that would be an example of mutualism. So in the early stages of decay, uh, I mentioned you have your latent fungi or primarily these are the endophytes that live in living tissues. So your tissues that they're primarily found in are gonna be the cambium just underneath the bark and the sapwood. When you get a drop in moisture, that will trigger these fungi to start growing fast and expanding their networks as they don't really have much time until more competitive species take over. Um, this group includes a lot of your primary saprophytes that invest in rapid growth. They're not very good at competing. Once you start getting those other fungi in there, they're gonna easily outcompete these ones. Uh, as quickly as they become dominant, they just as quickly disappear. Um, once those labile carbohydrates are exhausted, so those carbohydrates that are easily accessed. Uh, during this stage, we also have our xylariaceous ascomycetes. These ones will form these dense hyphal mats uh, surrounding colonies as a form of protection. And these mats are highly resistant to competitors where once formed, they can actually persist throughout that decay process. So they're not just limited to that early stage, but they will begin formation uh, early on in the decay process. Um, you might have uh, some uh, xylariaceous fungi that have characteristics of soft rot, um, but these ones can break down lignin similar to white rot, so that's where those categories kind of break down. Uh, early stages also include um, some latent white and brown rot fungi, so they're present, uh, but they're not really active and they're not actively decomposing that woody tissue just yet. That is for the next stage. So in the intermediate stage, you have your white and brown rots that dominate. Uh, they're oftentimes brought in by airborne spores, uh, insect vectors, um, beetles especially that form galleries. Uh, you might also have mycelial cords from the soil. So example being the armillaria species that produces thick cords. Uh, this group is highly competitive, uh, producing compounds to inhibit the growth of other species and they grow very, very fast. Um, they take some time to get established, but that rate of growth happens pretty quickly so they can outcompete each other. Eventually, these replace the primary colonizers um, because I mentioned before, they're not very good at competition. 
Uh, during this stage, you'll notice that the wood density substantially decreases due to the strong decay abilities of your white and brown rots. So after that wood has decayed for some time, uh, and this is probably fairly late in the process, a lot of times you'll notice that the uh, tree has already fallen, it's well rotted on the ground. Um, at this late stage, the wood becomes a very humid and nutrient rich environment. Uh, some of the white and brown rots may persist, but you'll also see some soft rots such as trichoderma or gliocladium take over. Uh, soft rots continue to decay remaining cellulose left behind by the white rot fungi, so there's still a little bit left, but the conditions are just not conducive for those white rot fungi to continue um, taking up those compounds, so the soft rots kind of take over. Uh, what's very interesting about the late stage uh, is that you will see a dramatic increase in the abundance of mycorrhizal fungi, um, and they, they can actually come to dominate this stage. Uh, this is a symbiotic organism, as I mentioned earlier, that is critical for important biotic interactions in the deadwood. Uh, they can help with the development of nurse logs to support tree seedlings uh, or tree seedling regeneration. However, the ability of mycorrhizal fungi to actually decay wood uh, is still unclear. There's, there are still some studies that are trying to clarify this relationship, but for the most part, we don't know if mycorrhizal fungi can truly be considered decay, wood decay fungi. All right, so how do these groupings and uh, these processes impact our forest communities? So as you can see here, we have a whole list of organisms, um, starting with bacteria. White rots are highly adaptable and can utilize a variety of carbon sources, uh, leading to beneficial associations with bacteria, particularly the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. This is due to the high availability of carbohydrates in white rotted wood, uh, which serves as an excellent food source for those nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Uh, the concentration of lignin and phenolic compounds that you find in brown rotted wood uh, is actually associated with a decrease of bacteria present and uh, tends to create more acidic conditions. Uh, I already mentioned mycorrhizal fungi um, and how they, de they increase during decomposition. Uh, the species present may depend on which decay type was present beforehand, so whether it was white rot or brown rot. So for example, some ectomycorrhizal fungi, uh, such as Amphimnema uh, bisoides, are associated with uh, white rots, while some species of ectomycorrhizal milk mushrooms, uh, like Lactarius, are more affiliated with your brown rots, or what comes after brown rot decomposition. Uh, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi are also have a beneficial association with brown rots, but less so with white rots. And these are very general um, statements. There's always a lot of variability in terms of which species um, do this or follow this. Uh, this could be a, a case of correlation versus causation. Uh, your next group is the protozoans, um, specifically slime molds. Uh, a lot of times you'll see in field guides that slime molds are often grouped with fungi. Um, but slime molds are organisms that are not at all related, not even closely related. Uh, if you were to look at a slime mold under a microscope, you will see that they're actually amoeba-like organisms that feed on fungi and bacteria in the environment. So they're considered predators. Uh, predators such as fungivores play key roles in ecosystems in terms of nutrient cycling, such as accelerating nutrient mineralization. Uh, this this type of decay can affect the nutrient availability and mobilization, as well as some of the food sources present for many um, of these organisms. Uh, then we have our bryophytes. Bryophytes, we a lot of times see mosses growing on well-decayed well -decayed logs, but they're not directly necessarily directly involved with wood decay. Uh, a lot of times what you will end up having is the wood decay fungi um, pretty much create these elevated surfaces that these bryophytes can take advantage of. Uh, deadwood is oftentimes raised above the ground, which means there's less leaf litter accumulation on that deadwood and light competition um, from other plants that would otherwise dominate. So that gives the, those mosses and liverworts a leg up 
uh, to help them compete. Uh, what's interesting is that some bryophytes, colonies can actually change coverage, thickness, and species composition throughout the decay process. Um, so there's some sort of influence going on there. Uh, wood decay can also influence the growth during certain stages of development in these organisms. All right, so your insects. Uh, this is where there are some very interesting relationships going on. Uh, beetles are most frequently observed group of insects with wood decay fungi. Um, wood decay can actually affect where beetles lay their eggs um, or affect ova position, as well as the food available to these beetles. Uh, beetles like the pleasing fungus beetle a lot of times depend on fungi for their diets. Uh, you have gallery forming beetles that will oftentimes receive nutritional benefits from fungi that are breaking down wood. As fungi are breaking down wood, they're releasing di different nutrients that those beetles can then take up. And rot type can even be associated with beetle size in some cases with certain types of rot that will cause beetles to be larger if they feed on that particular type compared to others. Uh, another group of insects. <coughs> Another group of insects that are affiliated with wood decay is termites. Um, this is kind of interesting because you oftentimes associate wood decay with termites, um, but the type of wood decay will affect um, the, those termite populations as well. Some species of termites are often attracted to your brown rotted wood. Uh, brown rot species such as gliophyllum, uh, trabium produce compounds that are similar to trail pheromones in termites. And some termite species will outright avoid white rots because ones such as Ganoderma aplanatum will actually produce chemicals that are toxic to termites. Now it's important to say not all white rots will do that, but in that particular species it will. And then we also have some wasp larvae that use uh, white rot fungi as an important food source. And then of course wildlife, um, I, I mentioned that fungi can help create uh, wildlife uh, dens through snags. Um, it gives nesting habitat as well as foraging sites, although really there's not a whole lot of data in this area. Uh, one uh, group of organisms that, or one group of wildlife species that we know um, does have an association are woodpeckers. They're known to excavate wood that has been softened by decay. Uh, another group that loves them, possums. They just love mushrooms and will use fungi as a food source frequently as do many other animals. Uh, probably when we're talking about uh, wood structure and composition, uh, probably one of the most important parts is seedling regeneration in the next generation forests. Uh, wood decay can determine which mycorrhizal fungi become dominant, which can then form symbiotic or beneficial relationships with those trees. Um, or those tree seedlings, even transferring nutrients from mature trees to those seedlings needing assistance. Uh, some bryophytes may also support seedlings, liverworts that depend on acidic environments created by uh, wood decay fungi, particularly brown rots, um, will produce those thin mats that are important for survival of spruce seedlings. Wood decay can affect the amounts of nutrients uh, present overall, like our malaria fungi have oftentimes been found to have more calcium and potassium um, levels relative to other fungi in the area. And then Postia fungi will release uh, iron and aluminum. In one study, white rots were found in general to create higher levels of calcium, potassium, and magnesium in naturally decayed pine logs, whereas brown rots were associated more with those nitrites. And what this essentially means is that dead wood can be a hot spot for tree generation. So why do we care about this process? Um, it's, it's a lot going on. We're working with these highly complex systems. So what, what do they affect that we actually care about? Uh, one being carbon sequestration. Uh, carbon has been a major topic of conversation of late. Uh, woodlands are often thought of as carbon sinks, uh, taking in more carbon than releasing. Uh, this is a balancing act though. The decay process generally moves nutrients and carbon through hyphal networks and disturbance of soils with these networks in them can actually release carbon, turning a site into a source of carbon rather than a sink. However, a lot is not really known about forests in the US and to what degree the decomposition process influences that carbon cycle. 
the U.S. Forest Service has recently started a long-term experiment looking at the role of wood decomposition in forest carbon cycles to help address these questions around carbon sequestration. Um, if you want to look into uh, this experiment a little more, it's the face wood decomposition experiment. So in terms of agroforestry, uh, the first practice that comes to mind is gourmet mushroom production. Uh, as mentioned earlier, shiitakes are a type of white rot that can be grown as, supp as a supplemental crop in managed woodlot woodlots. Um, but you can also use oyster mushrooms, lion's mane. Uh, there's a whole variety of wood decay fungi that are uh, frequently cultivated as crops uh, in forestry systems. And they can be used for additional income. Uh, wood decay fungi also can influence crop tree management. Uh, trees growing mushrooms are structurally compromised and help help you make a decision on which trees to remove from the to open up that canopy. Um, because remember, these trees that are producing those fruiting bodies are structurally not sound, and if they come down, they could damage your healthy crop trees that you want to keep around. Uh, you can completely remove these trees from a woodlot or leave them there. Um, keep in mind that while infected trees that are felled and left behind are less likely to spread decay fungi to other trees compared to infected trees left standing, the risk is still greater um, than completely removing those trees altogether. Uh, it ultimately comes down to what your management goals are. If wildlife habitat is more important, the benefits may outweigh the risks of leaving that decayed tree alone and just letting it sit at the bottom of the, um, in the forest understory. Uh, mycoherbicides. Uh, some decay fungi have been utilized as a type of herbicide to kill weed trees. Uh, the most studied species is the silverleaf fungus, which is a pathogen that attacks members of the rose family. It also grows on deadwood, making it a treatment option for re-sprouting stubs, or re-sprouting re stumps. Uh, they are also applied for stump decay. So uh, the closest study I could find um, was actually one done up in Michigan uh, with the silver leaf fungus as a control option for invasive buckthorn species. Uh, the data collected indicated that the fungus reduced that sprouting in buckthorns to be removed and that those treatments were, in that case, uh, comparable to glyphosate applications. Uh, that said, other studies have actually found that synthetic herbicides are still more efficient when we're talking about the short term at preventing re-sprouting of treated plants than the silverleaf fungus. But we don't really have any good long-term comparisons to make. Um, so it might be that long-term this fungus um, is, a, is better at reducing that uh, re-sprouting, um, but right now we just don't have that, that data. Uh, the fungus, uh, the fungus's effectiveness is highly variable between tree and shrub species as well and a lot of times depends on the conditions at time of inoculation, so that makes it more variable and difficult to work with. Um, also, if you have an orchard nearby or you love your apple trees, you might not want to be growing this fungus or applying this fungus nearby because it is considered to be a pathogen of apple trees since they belong to that rose family. Uh, most tree diseases of concern are caused by fungi. Uh, native fungi typically don't lead to major issues, but new fungi that are brought in through human activity or through rain change, range changes can pose a problem for species that have not uh, developed that defense mechanism just yet. Uh, some examples included here, uh, oak wilt, which is on the lower left. It's a little hard to see in that photo, but that's a grafted root system, which is um, how oak wilt might spread from tree to tree, um, but it can also spread, be spread by beetles. Uh, this fungus is highly destructive to oaks. Ugh, oaks. It plugs up the vascular networks, uh, transporting water in the plant, interfering with that water uptake, and leading to those wilt sy symptoms. Uh, in the middle here, we have an American elm tree that was killed by Dutch elm disease. Uh, this fungus uh, is Ophiostoma, is an invasive fungus in North America, and is primarily spread by bark beetles. Very similar to oak wilt, the fungus plugs up the water moving the vascular system. Uh, it can also move through root grafts and this allows that fungus to move quickly through, through that tree. And that's why it's so destructive. Uh, the diffuse canker of chestnut blight is shown here on the right. 
Uh, American chestnuts once dominated North American forests, but have now been decimated. The species is now considered functionally extinct thanks to the fungus that causes chestnut blight, um, Cryptonectria uh, parasitica. The fungus causing chestnut blight was brought in from East Asia sometime prior to 1920, with some estimates going as far back as even 1876. Uh, it was primarily sped, spread via animal vectors and windboard spores, which infect and kill that cambium tissue producing those cankers. So it's more of a canker uh, rot than a wood decay rot, but it's still within that wood decay spectrum. In the cases of these fungi, they have wiped out entire reproductive populations of their host in many areas, and that affects your composition of your woodlands. Um, we've seen this across Ohio as well as across North America. And just as a side note on deforestation events, um, deforestation often leads to infections by wood decay fungi. You have a lot of damaged trees, a lot of wounding in the wood. Uh, that's going to allow wood decay fungi to take off. You also have storms and bark beetle mass mortality that can create openings in a woodland canopy. And these openings create more air circulation and reduced humidity. Uh, that leads to these areas to being slightly warmer than what they would have been uh, had they still had a full canopy. And it's been, actually been hypothesized that these warmer, drier conditions tend to favor your brown rots more so than your white rots. So in these photos here, we've got some examples of some deforestation events. Um, we've got a dead ash uh, left behind by emerald ash borer. And then on the right is tornado damage uh, that went through um, a woodlot there. All right, and last couple of slides, we'll talk a little bit about management. How can you utilize the wood decay process um, for your woods? There are many implications for even age stands with wood decay. Um, a lot of times we talk about when we're talking about forest, forestry management, we want those uneven stands with diverse uh, numbers of trees at different ages. Um, those are preferred over even aged woods to reduce the likelihood of losing an entire woodlot. It's common sense that older trees uh, past that maturity point are the greatest hazard for wood decay. The younger trees tend to be less vulnerable due to their ability to heal wounds very quickly. And those trees that are slowly infected and not caught early may be a threat to those healthy trees in the area. So it's a bit of a delicate balance between rotating trees based on a pathological rotation where the goal is to minimize decay and the economic rotation where the goal is to maximize wood production. So some preventative measures you can take if uh, wood decay is of concern, um, reduce wounding. Uh, wounds may be human caused or caused by storm damage. Uh, wounds that are at greatest risk of uh, getting infected with wood decay fungi tend to be 18 inches uh, or within eight or ugh, within 16 inches of the soil line. And if you have wounds that are two inches or more in deep uh, in depth that go into the trunk, that can lead to some of your heart rots that are problematic. Uh, heart rots are especially associated with uh, deep wounding. Uh, remove old trees with open, uncalloused holes, blind knots, and sprouts. Uh, and then, we, in extension, we sound like a broken record on this, but keep livestock out of the woods. Um, a lot of times they can cause wounding to the plant's root system, which is the absolute worst place to get a wound um, for it to get infected by root rot and wood decay fungi. Uh, and that's primarily caused by trampling or those animals stepping on those roots. Uh, insect buildup. Um, so insects that transmit fungi uh, can be managed by diversifying woodlands. Your understock stands tend to have greater susceptibility to uh, branch breakage uh, and wind throw while your overstock stands, uh, you don't have as much light. So you got greater uh, competition for light. So you're gonna get more top breakage because those stems are becoming going to be more whip-like. Um, species that tend to do this, your red maples that are older than 20 years and yellow poplars. Uh, so these might not be species that you want to have in your woodlands uh, as they are more susceptible to wood damage, um, as well as those trees with larger crowns that might have uh, greater loads on them uh, that can end up falling and damaging your 
the trees that you want to keep around. If complete removal of an issue tree is not affordable, you can leave the trees on the ground uh, when lying flat. Inoculum dispersal tends to be limited. And decay fungi are actually overtaken at this point by other organisms responsible for uh, decomposition. So in summary, uh, I think we're at an hour 15 minutes. Um, but the key takeaways I want you to take away from this talk today are that um, wood decay fungi are neither all bad or all good in many cases, uh, but they can make a significant impact on the structure and composition of our woodlands. Uh, wood decay fungi can influence and be influenced by ecological succession, determining which microbial species make up the entire decay process from beginning to end. And your wood decay fungi can be managed or utilized based on what your goals are for your woodlands. So with that, um, that's pretty much what I have for you today. Um, I apologize, it's a lot of information I just threw at you, um, but we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Awesome, thank you, Erica. Awesome is right. Lots You're, of good stuff. Yeah, lots of, it's a, I don't mind the, information and your slides are just so pretty. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> oh, that's, how does she do that? It looks so nice. Okay, we do have questions, so let's jump right into those. Um, first one is from Bob, and he is asking, is there any benefit when planting hardwood trees from dripping, dipping, excuse me, plant roots into a mycorrhizal solution? If so, are there specific products to use? So that's a great question, Bob, um, and one that oftentimes comes up. So one of the things that you want to be careful with, uh, there's a lot of um, products out there on the market that advertise mycorrhizal benefits to those treed seedlings. Keep in mind, uh, a lot of your mycorrhizal species um, have specific relationships with particular host species, um, and that will depend on what those are. Um, a lot of times what they found uh, or what the research has shown is that the products that you use for inoculation don't tend to compete very well with the microbes that are already on that root system. A lot of times the best thing you can do is encourage your native mycorrhizal fungi to thrive. So that would be mostly through uh, reducing disturbance in those areas. Uh, the other thing that you want to uh, be careful of is look at the containers and see how many spores um, or uh, mycelium is in that product. Uh, some of those containers, you might only see a few spores uh, and the rest of it is just filler. So if you only have a few, chances are they're not going to colonize at all. Um, so you just want to be careful. Um, in general, the research has indicated that there, those products tend not to be as beneficial um, or at least beneficial where you're seeing an economic return. Um, the best thing to do is to encourage what's already there. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder for everybody, um, if you could please enter your questions into the Q&A box, it's a little strip, it's on the little strip at the bottom of your Zoom. As all the comments are coming in, I see a, que a couple questions in the chat and I don't want them to get lost. Um, okay, next, the question is, should canker wounds that are made by deer grazing be treated or sealed off with tree root wound compound? That is a fantastic question. Um, with your wounding process, a lot of times your trees already have a natural defense. Um, there's not really a whole lot you can do once that wound occurs. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is put like uh, a paint over it or a coating. Um, the only time that you might consider doing something like that is what, if you think there's a threat of oak wilt. Um, but for everything else, um, just leave that wound exposed to air, that tree. Um, hopefully we'll be able to seal, seal it off if it's healthy enough. Um, a lot of times what we see problems with wounding is, uh, it depends on how deep that wound is. Um, and then if that tree is already not in good health, um, and in those cases, it should probably be removed. Uh, but yeah, one of the, one of the best things you can do is just, just let it go. Let the tree heal on its own. If it's healing on its own. Now, one thing you can do, if it's like branches that are damaged, you can proper go back and properly prune those branches so they can uh, seal off correctly where you get that callus that appears all the way around um, that wound tissue. Uh, Rick is asking, does juglin produce by, produced by black walnut trees fight off fungi? You know, that's a good question. Um, and that I don't know off the top of my head, but I will take a look into that. Um, I would so think not because usually juglone 
fights off competitive plants, not, um, and you, and you still have walnuts that have, I have walnuts that have nectar of canker. That's why I was listening when you were doing the nectar of canker. I have walnuts that have nectar of canker all over the place. So at least in that scenario, it didn't help anything. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of times I think it might be like, there are certain fungi that have adapted where they have been able to work around a plant's defense system. So it might, like, I'm not sure if there are certain fungi that it does work against, but yeah, it sounds like nectaria is not one of them. No, it's not. I can verify that. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah's asking, are you aware of treatment options for honey mushrooms to save a tree, or is it too late once the fruiting bodies have been seen over uh, several years? So yeah, with honey mushrooms, they, um, a lot of um, woodland owners have difficulty with this one because they, they're so, they're a good generalist and they can take over a lot of trees. Um, but much like other fungi, if they've been fruiting for several years, um, that tree's probably been infected for quite some time and its wood tissue is probably well colonized. Um, that said, um, those armillaria species are more parasitic um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that tree has to come down right away. Um, if safety is a concern, I would definitely contact an arborist to assess that situation. Um, but it could be like um, the fungus might is a, considered to be a weak parasite or a weak pathogen. So that tree may still have a few more years. I would look at the canopy, how much canopy is left. Um, are you seeing any thinning out or um, die back? Uh, Ava or Eva, excuse me if I mispronounce that, is asking, what effect, if any, do invasive trees and shrubs have on the forest fungi versus native species of trees and shrubs? That is a great question and one that I don't believe is well researched. Um, there's actually been a question of invasive fungi and how they interact with our native fungi and that a uh, golden oyster might potentially be considered to be an invasive fungus, but there's not a whole lot of data out there just yet to call, um, to make that call. And with plants, yeah, a lot of those uh, invasive plants, they're going to likely have associations with the fungi that are native to their place of origin. So there might be a bit um, of a, a loss, especially if you're dealing with your um, fungal specialists that have those um, uh, specific associations with trees. If those trees are being lost to invasive species, then you're going to see a decline in those fungi. And that's why the, um, the specialists are so vulnerable to extinction or extirpation. Um, it, those generalists are probably not going to be as, as affected as much. But that's a great question. So Erica, since so many of our non-native invasive plants have leaf litter that produces a, such great changes in the soil chemistry, changes pH, changes mm -hmm. other things, puts a lot of allelopathic chemicals in there, um, that to me seems like that's like a whole yeah. system that would have to re- orient itself if that's what we're dealing with, right? Yeah, and absolutely. Especially if you have those pH changes where the soil is becoming more neutral or basic over time, mm -hmm. that's not going to support your brown rot species, which subsequently affects your mycorrhizal colonization, which species right. do well in that. Um, so it will affect the composition of those communities as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of like complete loss of a species of fungus, that would be more of a risk to your specialist. Yeah. Okay. Still notable changes. Uh, Judith is asking, just trying to understand in the home landscape, when you see any trees growing mushrooms, is it wise then to make a plan to take out that tree? It's probably wise to start a plan. Um, the other thing too, you would probably want to ident identify what fungus is in that tree um, and see if you want to replace that tree with something else, make sure it's not going to get infected from the tree that's showing symptoms. Um, a lot of it will depend on uh, the structural integrity of that tree, and that's where um, you would need someone with their uh, to come out and inspect the tree for safety. Um, but in general, if your tree has a full canopy, uh, you might have a little bit more time left, but it is time to start that transition plan uh, to take that tree out. 
Next question, can specialist fungi be reintroduced into ecosystems? Yeah, as long as the conditions are there and the host is there. Um, going back to, I mean, we talk about the disease triangle, but really that applies to a lot of our fungal species. We need the host plant present, we need the environmental conditions present, and we need that species present to inoculate. So if, they, let's say they were extirpated from that area, um, but the um, through replanting and conditions have been made similar to when that species thrived there, you could potentially reintroduce it. Now, there's go still going to be an issue with competition. It probably won't have the leg up that it had before um, in terms of competing with other species that are there. Uh, but in that those cases, you, you can you can give it a try. Barbara's asking, I heard people are stripping lichens and fungi off of trees thinking it is spotter, uh, spotted lanternfly eggs. How can we better educate folks to avoid damaging a tree's bark layers? Uh, that is a good question. Um, yeah, scraping off lichen um, is going to cause some wounding that could potentially open that tree up for wood decay fungi or pathogenic fungi to invade. Um, so a lot of it is just, um, at least the questions that I sometimes get at the office is, um, are these lichen bad for the tree or are they pathogenic? Lichen are just chilling out on the surface. I think it would be a matter of getting some samples of lichen uh, to show folks and then using an example like um, we have, uh, I think every extension office now has like the 3D printed um, egg masses um, or the cards. Um, and, and just show them the difference between those. Because typically your lichen, they're going to be more full, they're, they're going to have more uh, a foliage look to them uh, in some cases, or they might have um, these branching like structures that those uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses are not going to have. And it gets a little bit easier as we go later on in the season and those egg masses start to lose that waxy coat and you get those strips of eggs that don't really look at all like, like lichen, or at least to me they don't. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it definitely needs some more education there. And that's a fantastic point. Laura's asking, can nail holes in trees cause wounds that get infected by fungi? For example, some people drive nails into trees to, to label them. Uh, yes, they can. Uh, so it's much as with uh, any time you're creating an opening in that wood, um, probably a nail hole could be considered similar to like a beetle gallery. You could get a spore in there that just uh, happens to be uh, compatible with that tree species that then takes off. Um, that said, that tree is going to have uh, some defenses against that. Uh, so nails, if they're getting into the heartwood, you do have some antifungal compounds that will at least limit your sap rots. Um, but if you have one that can't, that is adapted to be a heart rot, that's when that would be uh, of major concern because they have evolved around that. Um, many of your sap rots in living trees, they can uh, essentially cut off those areas and compartmentalize them uh, in that reaction zone. Uh, that said, you want to limit wounding as much as possible. Um, so generally, uh, hammering nails into tree is not, trees are, is not recommended if you want to keep that tree around for a long, long time. Would leaving snags up on an urban, suburban, excuse me, lot increase the risk of fungal damage to nearby trees? A lot of it would depend on the type of tree. Generally, by the time you have a snag, you're in the late stages of wood decay, and those species don't tend to do well uh, competing with uh, the already living communities of endophytes that are already on that um, living tree. So there is a bit of a reduced risk with competition. But then um, again, you have species uh, like ones that cause oak wilt or chestnut blight. Um, sometimes those can be airborne. And in those cases, if you have a susceptible tree, um, then it would be of, of concern. But for the most part, those snags, um, I would say probably the biggest risk in an urban area is just making sure it's not gonna fall on someone or, or a house or a structure. Mm -hmm. Laura is asking, when the temperature drops, do fungi die or go dormant? Good question. Uh, it depends on the fungus, but for the most part, um, they go dormant. Uh, a lot of fungi have developed structures. Um, didn't really get into the terminology too much, but um, some will develop 
uh, sclerotia, which are these hardened black structures that they can overwinter in, and they can actually survive some really hostile environments as that dormant stage. Uh, and then once temperatures start to rise again, then that um, fungus will start to grow, produce fruiting bodies that will then infect um, the plants around it. So they do have some adaptations. Um, that said, if you have like my exposed mycelium, uh, so if you're into growing gourmet mushrooms, they always say um, don't throw like pink oyster spawn into the fridge because that will kill it. Um, pink oyster is a tropical species. So a lot of it depends on what type of fungus you're working with. But for the most part, our native fungi here ha do have some sort of adaptation for our typical Ohio winters um, as well as summers. Do you recommend adding mycorrhizal fungi when planting trees in urban soils? You know, that's a great question. I would say urban soils, you probably have less competition. Um, and that is one of the areas where I think there is some studies out there that have shown um, if you have an area that's devoid um, of um, mycorrhizal fungi, that's where inoculations might do the best or benefit the most. Um, that said, I would still check the product that you order and make sure like there's more than like three spores per container um, and that you're following those product labels. Uh, but even so, um, you could probably try inoculating with uh, soil brought in from like maybe a woodland area and use that for inoculating since those fungi would be native uh, to that area as well. Speaking to that that kind of topic, um, are are mycorrhizal fungi present in all woodlands and suburban yards, or are there reasons they are not present? So yeah, they're um, for the most part mycorrhizal fungi have had a long history of um, co-evolving with plants. Um, I think it's like eighty to ninety percent of um, tree species have those associations with those fungi. There are some plants like those belonging to the brassica group that do not support mycorrhizal fungi at all. And then also if you're applying a lot of fertilizer, let's say you have a homeowner who's applied phosphorus fertilizer every single year and your phosphorus levels are off the chart, um, those plants are not going to have a need for those mycorrhizal fungi. So those fu fungi are likely going to die off. Um, so, so you won't have that relationship in those areas. Now, is it going to completely sterilize the soil? That's really hard to do. Um, so there's probably still going to be a few there, but um, there are certain situations that can drastically reduce those mycorrhizal populations. And what about herbicides? Can they kill them? Herbicides? Well, if they kill a plant that is the host for that fungus, um, they can. Uh, a lot of times fungi are pretty good at breaking down um, some pesticides, not all, and there are fungicides. So that would probably be more of a concern is if you're applying a fungicide in your yard, um, that can impact uh, some of those fungal communities. And I think this might be our last mycorrhizal fungi question. <laughs> I was getting all those <laughs> out. Um, how long does it take for mycorrhizal fungi to find its way into an urban yard? Well, there's probably still some in, even though um, some areas have been urbanized for quite some time, um, a lot of your mycorrhizal species, especially your ectomycorrhizal fungi that produce the mushrooms, those mushrooms are producing spores that are airborne. So you've got spores everywhere. Um, it's just a matter of them finding a place uh, to land and then germinate. That's the biggest question. Mm -hmm. So there probably are still some in urban areas, uh, just maybe not the number, depending on the site history, uh, not near the amount that you would encounter like in natural areas. Um, but in terms of how long, that would depend on a lot of different factors, um, including if there's anything that's inhibiting growth of those mycorrhizal fungi, um, if you have plants that are um, uh, get, that can serve as hosts uh, to mycorrhizal fungi, um, and then of course environmental conditions. Uh, Linda's asking, are the farmed fungi native? And if not, are they invasive? And do we see them becoming a problem in areas where people are growing them? So that's a good question. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good answer to that at this point. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done on that. Um, it has been hypothesized and hypothesized only um, that um, the golden oyster 
might be something that was brought in. Uh, golden oysters are adapted for tropical areas, and they're starting to find them in areas that they are not necessarily native to. Um, they're still not sure to what degree these fungi outcompete native uh, fungi. Um, unfortunately, there's just not enough mycologists in the world to to answer um, a lot of these questions. Um, now that said, there are um, so I think there's like a Morel um, farm in Michigan um, the, where people have started finding those species of morels outside that area. I don't think anyone's going to argue about um, More invasive morel. morels. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and a lot of it would just depend on that association. But for the most part, it's an area that's just we don't know. We don't have a whole lot of information on just yet. Um, I know they are proposing some studies to start looking at that. Uh, Linda's also asking if you have fungi in your yard, for example, fairy ring or other fungi, is there a way to eliminate slash kill them other than removing all wood that is under the soil? So when you get into fairy ring fungi, not all of those are wood decay fungi. Um, a lot of times they're associated with thatch um, or they can help build up thatch where they're creating a hydrophobic layer in the soil that's essentially repelling water um, so water can't get down into the uh, turf root system. Um, a lot of that's going to come down to good lawn care practices, um, making sure you're not using like species that tend to be more thatch forming, um, which is sometimes easier said than done. There are different stages of fairy ring production, so you won't necessarily see the complete die off um, of a circular area just yet, but you might get those fruiting bodies. And you might actually notice around the ring, um, the turf grows darker because there's more uh, nitrogen um, in those areas that's creating that. Uh, in terms of removal, I'm not aware of any fungicides that you can apply to get rid of those. Um, and they can, once they form, they can be fairly difficult. Um, that said, I've seen a lot of fairy rings that just disappear on their own over time. They get out competed by what's already there. Um, you can try aerating um, to help and that's probably one of the best things you can do to allow water to infiltrate down into that soil and help that grass uh, get through that. But that's a good question. Corey is asking if you have any recommendations for a guide on edible mushrooms. There have been some fake ones posted on Amazon, and obviously that's not something you want to mess around with. <laughs> yeah, always be careful of... Uh, um, there, yeah, now we're seeing more and more AI generated books and there is a concern. So um, we actually just had a presentation at a library last month um, where we were having that discussion. Um, and someone had mentioned, make sure you're purchasing books from a reliable publisher. Um, mm -hmm. That should be the first thing that you should look for is, is this publisher well known? Have they produced a lot of good books in the past? Um, in terms of good uh, guides, a lot of the guides I know of, they won't outright recommend uh, whether or not a species is edible, but um, I do like for identifying mushrooms, um, I think it's Mushrooms of Northeast North America by George Barron, has some pretty good photos in it. Um, there is one by Audubon uh, that makes you go through the dichotomous keys a little bit more rather than relying on photos. Um, I like Mushroom Expert. Um, dot com, which is um, Michael Kuo is the creator of that website, and I believe he's written several um, field guides. He will not recommend edibility, but he has some fantastic uh, dichotomous keys that you can work through uh, to uh, get a more accurate um, identification. Now that said, with edible species, um, I won't outright recommend edible species because everyone reacts to them differently, even if they are considered edible. So for example, I can't eat morels because they make me really sick. Um, <laughs> it sucks. <How> horrible. <laughs> Aww. And I really like morels. Um, so yeah, everyone's going to react differently. So just because a, a mushroom is labeled as edible, doesn't you want to make sure if you're going to try it for the first time, start small. Um, generally speaking, your oysters, your morels, um, your hen of the woods, uh, chicken of the woods, are your go-tos uh, for edible species. Just make sure you're 100% sure in your identification of those before eating them. Um, anything that's not one of the common um, edible species, especially if you're a novice in the area, I would not recommend starting uh, with like some weird ones um, because they're, 
with certain fungi, it's very hard to tell species apart. And there are some that are closely related. Some are considered to be, well, this one might be edible, but then they have one that's deadly um, if you eat it. So um, just use caution when you're searching for edible species. Um, but yeah, like those authors, George Barron, Michael Kuo, um, are pretty good. Um, Mushrooms Demystified. Um, it's an older field guide, so some of the names are out of date, um, but that's another good one. Um, it, but it won't necessarily recommend edible species. A lot of them won't venture into yeah. the edible just because. Yeah. I hardly blame them. Yeah. It's risky. And a, a lot of that you gain by experience. I would say if that's something you're interested in, go out with someone who's a knowledgeable uh, forager mm -hmm. um, who has done this numerous times. That's the best way uh, to identify them. But keep in mind, even if you have a lot of experience uh, with foraging, all it takes is one mistake um, right. to put you in the hospital. So just be careful. And I'm like you with chicken of the woods. I, I love morels and can eat tons of them, but chicken of the woods, I can just yeah. do okay. a little bit before <laughs> I have some reactions. So yeah, it's definitely by person. Mm. Well, we yeah, have for me. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say like chicken of the woods for me is not like, I don't know if it's because it's alternative name is sulfur shelf and it just put that name sulfur in my brain. So now when I eat it, it tastes like sulfur. So I just don't, I'm not a big fan of that one. But that said, I, I know a bunch of people who like that one cause it does taste like oh, chicken. Yeah. yeah, it's a big, yeah, it, is, it is tasty. And I'm not a mushroom enthusiast, but I do like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a maple question. Uh, if you're tapping maples in the spring, should you fill these holes with something to prevent fungi from getting in after you remove the tap? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I would just let the tree seal it off as best it can on its own. Uh, don't try sealing off any other wounds um, unless you're if unless you have a risk of oak wilt in the area. Other than that, the best thing you can do is just um, limit the number of wounds that you're putting in the tree as best as possible. But yeah, with maple production, you can't really do that. So um, trees have a pretty good defense against a lot of different fungi. The issue comes when they start going into decline or if they weren't planted right. So building up those cultural or making sure you're using the right cultural practices to begin with um, and reducing any other kind of wounding to those trees, uh, you'll get greater longevity out of those trees. Most of the time by the next season, you'll have a hard time finding that tap hole because they have calloused mm -hmm. over because that's part of pattern tapping, right? So you have to find last year's tap hole so you know where to go six inches down and three inches over for the next one. And I can't tell you how many times I spend more time looking for that last tap hole than I do drilling the new one. So yeah, it would be easy to yeah, find, the, but <laughs> it's not easy. And, and the trees are pretty good at taking care. Now, what I will say is what you just um, said, Eric, is that if in a year that hasn't completely calloused over, that's kind of an indication that the tree is probably mm -hmm. not doing as well um, as you would like it to be. So it's a tree to keep an eye on if you're looking at production. Good stuff. Uh, Stephen says that he has a very old maple. Does fungus cause the burls? Um, like, like you're talking about, like, kind of like the gall-like structures that can be on the trunk? I would assume he doesn't say. Okay. Yeah, some of those can be caused by fungi. They can also be caused by a variety of other issues. Um, it's hard to say without actually taking a look at um, where that issue is. Um, as far as I know, like specific species to maple that would cause those type of galls, um, I'm not as familiar with those. Um, Stephen has another question about um, beech trees. So they're, he has over 50, they're very old, uh, estimating 200 to 250 years old. And he's noticed that almost every one of them um, have the form of a drinking straw where the heartwood is entirely void. He said he's lost four of these very mature trees in the past four years. And in his lifetime around the, his property, um, he doesn't remember a beach that did have its internal heartwood. So he's wondering what's going on. Is it a particular brown rot or something that's different? Yeah, there's, um, there's quite a few fungi that um, will form 
uh, heart rot in beaches. Um, if these trees were all planted at the same time um, and they're all getting to that point um, of maturity at the same time, they might all be just like having um, a similar fungus that's attacking them. But um, a lot of that would just depend on like what fruiting bodies you're seeing uh, being produced to accurately identify what's going on there. Um, but yeah, beach, there's quite a few um, fungi out there that do, do cause heart rot. Uh, someone is asking, do our malaria honey mushrooms actually bioluminesce? That's a good question. So when we talk about bioluminescence in fungi, um, you have to manage your expectations. Um, for <laughs> example, um, jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, um, they're probably the most well-known at bioluminescence, but you have to stare at them for a really long time to actually see the glow. <laughs> You're not going to be able to like look out in the woods and, oh, it glows. Um, and I think our malaria is similar. Like if it does produce a luminescence, it would probably be very faint that you might not necessarily be able to detect with your, um, with the naked eye. Hmm. Interesting. Becky is asking if you can explain smooth patch disease and is this harmful to our trees? So that's a good question. I am not familiar with smooth patch disease. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to have to be one I, I look into. Yeah, I don't know that one either. Um, usually, it's mm -hmm. not usually thought of as harmful. Um, it happens on a couple of different species. I think about ash is one that you used to see it on quite frequently. Um, I always thought it more of like a lichen issue, right? You know, it's on the outside of the tree that creates the smooth patch, but nothing's really going on inside the tree, at least not to my knowledge. So that's kind of my limited um, access to the smooth patch disease question. So it might be something that's more of a sap rod or it could be endophytic where it's just forming right. that fruiting body on the surface. Yeah. All right, a couple more questions. Thanks for sticking with us, Erica. Uh, Bob's asking, what time of the year are fungal spores most commonly found in the air? It's a good question. So um, they're going to be found anytime the temperatures start warming up and you're getting fruiting bodies that are being produced. So in the springtime, you're going to get some. Um, generally, those time periods when you're having a temperature change, either going from cold to warm, um, and you've also got a change in humidity. Um, you're going to get a, you're going to see a lot more production. Um, typically, midsummer, I see probably the greatest diversity of fruiting bodies. If we get adequate rain, if we have a dry year, you're not going to see as much. Um, but spore production is dependent on uh, having that fruiting body or mushroom being produced. If you don't have a mushroom being produced, you're not going to necessarily get spores. Um, so spring and fall are probably the biggest times that are associated with um, mushroom uh, growth. But that said, you might have some peaks in the summertime after rainfall. Matthew's asking if growing mushrooms in wood chips, does adding leaf litter on the top of the chips help the already established culture? So yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably if the leaf litter is like already in that backyard, I don't think it could hurt. Um, you're adding in some um, microbes that are actively decomposing that leaf litter um, that can uh, help build up that soil organic matter. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say you need to bring it in from elsewhere. I would use it from on site. Are there any fungi slash mushrooms that you shouldn't touch because of their toxi toxicity or is toxicity just related to actually eating the fungi? So yeah, um, toxicity is mostly, so fungi will produce mycotoxins um, that are what we're concerned with. Generally speaking, you have to ingest those to have that effect. Um, you, can, you can touch any, any fungus out there and it's not gonna kill you. What you have to be careful of is if you're touching it and then you go and eat a hamburger, um, just make sure you thoroughly wash your hands um, because you can potentially, like deadly gallerina, it doesn't take a whole lot. Um, to be a problem. Um, but yeah, you can touch, for the most part, 
it shouldn't, unless you have an allergy to a mushroom uh, or to a fungus, um, you, you can handle them and they're not going to do anything. Um, just make sure to wash your hands afterwards. Laura said the book Mycelium Running by Paul Stamets discussed mushrooms that remove heavy metals. Is this a problem in Ohio woods? Um, so a lot of that depends on the site. Like um, uh, the area that I'm in will probably have some sites where there's some heavy metal contamination uh, along the Ohio River. You might have cadmium. Uh, that's an issue or chromium. Uh, I know there has been quite a bit of work with mycoremediation where those fungi are used to pull heavy metals um, from the soil. You want to be careful because if you just let those fungi rot uh, after they pull those up, it's just going to go right back into the soil again. Um, and also we have to manage our expectations. Um, a lot, it might not, it, research has shown that they can uptake those heavy metals, um, but it might not necessarily be the complete renovation that you're looking for. Um, so a lot of times it's a multi-stage process. But yeah, I would say the biggest thing is if you plan on doing something like that, um, just make sure you remember to remove the fruiting body before it decomposes. And don't eat it. <laughs> and our last question uh, is about pruning or cutting down a tree with de decay or obvious fungi present. Is there a way or need to disinfect the saw or pruning shaws or any other shears or any other equipment so that um, the fungi isn't spread to the next tree that is pruned? Yeah, that, and that's a, um, in general, when you're pruning, that's a good practice to do anyways for sanitation is to disinfect um, your equipment. But yeah, you would wanna do it if you know a tree has a wood decay problem um, and you're working with a dead tree, probably one of the worst things you can do is cut through that tree, not clean your tools, and then go work on a healthy tree because then you're creating an open wound that might not have time to seal off because that fungus is already there. Um, so it's kind of gotten some assistance. Uh, so yeah, good practice. Um, you don't necessarily have to clean in between every single cut unless you're working with a tree where you're trying to remove dead tissue from living tissue and you wanna keep that tree around. Um, but certainly clean off your tools in between trees uh, is good practice. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much, Erica. I'm going to stop the recording so Kathy can share the um, continuing ed link.